It is my pleasure now to welcome today's commencement speaker, <clears throat> Smith School alumnus Michael Ward, class of 1972. Michael is, is what many of you hope to become, tremendously successful. Michael Ward is the chairman and CEO of CSX Corporation, one of the largest transportation companies in the nation. CXX, CSX owns 84,000 rail cars running on 21,000 miles of track in 23 states, from Montreal in the north to Chicago in the west, down to New Orleans and Miami in the south. On an average day, there are more than 200,000 moving pieces of equipment on the CSX track. All that activity generates about $3 billion in net revenue for the company. And Michael has a small role to play. Actually, he's responsible for keeping the entire CSX on track. Michael Ward has spent his entire career at CSX and has headed his operations coal sales and marketing and finance departments, and he knows every aspect of the business which has given him unusual depth of insight into his industry. Michael Ward understands what it takes to succeed not just in business, but in life. He's been committed to helping others succeed, whether through his personal philanthropic efforts or through the scholarship he sponsors for Maryland undergraduates through the Maryland Incentive Awards program. The city of Baltimore is honored, has honored his commitment to corporate citizenship with City Year's prestigious Life of Idealism Award. I can think of no finer role model for you as you enter the working world. Please join me now in welcoming Michael Ward. Thank you, Dean, and thanks for inviting me to your celebration here and uh, having the ability to talk to you today. So, congratulations as you've just accomplished another major milestone in your life. And since this is a commencement exercise, I guess that means you're getting ready to commence the next phase of your life. And I guess here's a question for you. Do you know what's in the next phase of your life? Well, if you don't, don't feel bad about it because most people when they graduate do not know what that's going to bring. I didn't myself, and my guess is many of you from the smiles I'm seeing also don't know what it holds for you. So what I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit my, about my journey, my learnings over the years, over the 40 years since I graduated from the University of Maryland. When I was preparing for this presentation, that scared me. 40 years ago I graduated. so. You may not believe it or not, uh, but 40 years goes by really, really fast. That's my biggest learning for you today, is you can't believe how fast 40 years go by. And I know you probably can't envision that, but I'd suggest maybe you talk to your mom and dad about it. Or better yet, if you're lucky enough to still have your grandparents around, ask them about it. Because it's amazing how the years fly by, so remember, all that time is precious. Take advantage of it because it'll be zooming by before you know it. So, my journey began 61 years ago. I was uh, born in a blue collar section of Baltimore, Maryland. I was the oldest of eight children. My dad owned a pool hall when I was growing up. And one of the things he drilled in my head from my earliest memories, he said, you have to get a college education and you have to figure out how to pay for it because I can't. You know, eight children in a pool hall, it's a little hard to think about paying for a college education. Back then, the world was a little bit different. College was actually much more affordable in that era. I was able to work in an asphalt factory in the summer and earn enough money to, to pay for my tuition the next year. And I realize that's probably impossible now, but back then it was possible. So when I entered Maryland, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I had to get a college education. Dad told me that. So I thought, well, what do I want to do? And I thought, well, maybe someday I'd like to teach, but I'm not sure about that. 
So I said, why don't I go to the business school because if I end up teaching, I can teach business administration. And if I don't, I'll be much more marketable with a business degree than, than some other degree. So that's how I scientifically chose to, to go to the Smith School. Um, after I uh, attained my undergraduate degree, I decided to get my MBA because I decided at that point to really go forth with a business career. So interesting, I had never thought of this. My father came up to me and he said, you know, you had pretty good grades at Smith. He said, here's $25, apply to Harvard and see what they say. I said, what the heck is your $25? I'll do it. And surprisingly, they, they did accept me. And I went to the uh, Harvard Business School. And guess what? When I graduated from there, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work in business because I had this MBA in business. Um, so I knew that there were guys that wore white shirts and ties and went into air-conditioned offices and did something. I said, I think I want to do that. So here was my very scientific, well-thought-out job search. I said, I haven't been around my siblings for many years getting my education. I think I'll go back to Baltimore and any big company that'll hire me, that's where I want to work. So at the time, there was a, a company called uh, Chessie System, it's now CSX, hired me. And I've been blessed with a wonderful 35-year career there. As the dean mentioned, I've been in finance, sales and marketing, and operations. So I'd like to share with you a, a few thoughts and observations I have from my 35 years. So here, to me, is the most important lesson. Your personal integrity is the most valuable asset you have. It is invaluable, and if you happen to lose it, it's almost impossible to recover. So you need a really strong moral compass because during your life, you're going to have some very difficult choices to make, and you need to have that strong moral compass as you go forward. So here's a few questions I'd like you to consider when you get one of those difficult decisions. Would you be comfortable explaining to your friends and your family why you made this, the decision you did? Secondly, would you be comfortable with it being written up in the Wall Street Journal? And then thirdly, and probably most importantly, will you be able to look yourself in the mirror every day after you made those decisions? Never, never sacrifice your personal integrity for any cost or for any benefit. And you know, it's really not that hard because you will know in your heart what the right thing is. Just follow your heart. My next advice is when you go out there and seek where you're going to be, the organization must be right for you. Not you right for the organization, the organization right for you. Do you like the morals and values of the organization? What's the organization's purpose? That is, why do they exist? What, what do they do for society? And are you comfortable with that? Do you like that? And finally, do you like the people you're going to be working with? Because I'll guarantee you this, you will spend more time at work than any other activity that you have. More than you sleep, more than you recreate, more than community fairs, more than you spend with your family. You're going to end up spending more time at work, so you better like the people that you work with. Now, I'm going to probably be a little bit controversial here. I'd like to give you my perception on some of the advice, well-intentioned advice, I think some students are being given. And that's that you'll work for 10 or 15 different organizations over your career. I think that is really bad advice. And here's why. So when you're at the beginning of your career and you're trying to figure out where is that right organization for me, where should I be, excuse me, and you're changing jobs to find that right organization, I think that's perfectly legitimate. I'll tell you this, when I get that resume of the person that changes jobs every three to four years, I put that right in the garbage can as soon as I get it. Because what are they going to do for my organization? They're going to come in, it's going to take me a year or so to train them, a year for them to somewhat get up to speed, and then I'm finally starting to get some return. I'm teaching them my culture and they're gone. I don't need that. So 
I think if you really want to become a true in expert and impact the field of endeavor you choose, you need to stick with it. I mean, over time, you're going to acquire knowledge and wisdom through your successes, but you quite frankly will probably learn more from your failures and from your setbacks. And if you're not hanging around long enough to learn those lessons, you're really not going to become a true expert in whatever field you've chosen to excel in. Once you've chosen what that career choice is, put your organization's success ahead of your personal success. Now that may seem a little bit odd, you know, because I'm obviously I would think most of the people here are fairly ambitious or you wouldn't be pursuing uh, the degrees here at the Smith School. But trust me, if you put the organization's success first, it will be noticed and you will be given additional opportunities. I've seen a number of people ruin their careers, their careers as they view it, seeking that next job, that next opportunity, rather than choosing to excel in the current job that they have. So put the organization first. So I've heard this echoed by uh, both of our speakers today. I really would encourage you in your career, if you get a chance to do a job to put you out of your comfort zone, do it. And that, I've done that sometimes in my career, and other times I haven't. So let me tell you a funny story. So I was about 31 years old. I was an assistant vice president of sales and marketing, working in a nice office building in Cleveland, Ohio. And we have people in the field that run the trains. They deal with the unions, they get the trains out, they fix the locomotives. It's called a division manager. So they te were testing people to see whether they would be good at being a division manager. And I tested out very well for that. And the president of the company came to me and said, we would like you to consider being a division manager. So what I said to him was this. I said, I have so much more to learn in this job, so much more to contribute, maybe at some point in the future, but that's really not right for me now. What I was thinking was, oh my God, I don't want to do that. It's seven by 24 responsibility, dealing with unions. I don't know much about that. No way do I want to do that and leave this nice office I'm in. And unfortunately, he let me get away with that. Uh, later on in my career, I did get the opportunity to go out in the field and have that kind of experience. But many times, if you pass up that kind of opportunities, you won't get them again. So be willing to get out of your comfort zone. And it sounds like the Smith School has taught you how to do that. Another thought, if you get a chance to work on a cross-functional team or a project, grab it. Now, let's be honest, it'll probably be work duties over and above your normal responsibilities, but it will be worth it. You get a chance to get out there and explain to others your department, what you do, what's important to your function, but even more importantly, two things. You get to hear their perspective, their issues, and you learn more about what the whole organization does. And guess what else happens? People get to see you in action. They get to see your talents. And when future opportunities occur, they may think of you because of your project work with them. As your career progresses, most of you will probably have the opportunity to lead a group or a department at some time in your career. I have a few uh, thoughts of what's been successful for me. One, surround yourself with the smartest, most team-oriented people you can find. And ideally, find people smarter than you are. Secondly, really work to have a diversity, and diversity, I mean diversity of thought, diversity of style, and diversity of experience. Because you can really have some vigorous, two or three smart people working together can come up with good answers. Four to five with diverse backgrounds and thinking can come up with much better answers. So get that kind of team. Let them run. Don't micromanage. One of the problems when people move up in their career, they're very good at something. And when they get promoted, they tend to want to manage the process going forward. Don't do that. You won't like it. They won't like it. If you let them run, you'll get much more out of them. And then finally, give them all the credit for their successes. Never take credit for what they do. 
I mean, just think about it. If you really work hard on a project and your boss claims all the credit for it, how hard are you going to work on that next project? Probably not as hard. If he or she is giving you all the credit, you're going to work a little bit harder the next time. <clears throat> and then finally, as your life progresses, one of the hardest things to envision now, uh, but is really critical, is to find your purpose. What do you want to accomplish on your short time on this planet? For me, it took years, well, actually decades to figure out what that is, but I finally have. And my purpose is to make a positive difference in the lives of others, especially younger people who may have less opportunity to succeed. I need to make sure they get those opportunities to succeed. And fortunately, I'm in a position now where I can do that. So longer term, a purpose is a very good thing to have. So thank you for your attention. I hope some of my insights might have some value for you as you commence your next step on your life journey. And once again, congratulations.